From the smallest virus to the largest whale, the blueprints of every known life form on the planet are written into DNA with just four letters. A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. They make up the alphabet that the shared language of all life forms is written. Just four letters since the dawn of time, until now. Hi, hello, and other such phrases. I'm the Defective Brain, and this week we are looking at a paper published in Nature on the 15th of May 2014 by the Scripps Research Group in association with New England Biolabs. The title of the paper? A semi-synthetic organism with an expanded genetic alphabet. In this work, the researchers added two new letters to the genetic alphabet, creating the first ever organism known to have six letters for its genetic code. I'm here to tell you how they did it, and how they proved that they did it. Come and join me for a journey into the world of molecular biology. For a couple of years there have been researchers experimenting with expanding the genetic alphabet. The letters of the genetic code actually represent chemicals that form the DNA strand called nucleotides. They pair up using hydrogen bonds, and only a few pairs can be made. For instance, adenine can only pair with thymine. Guanine can only pair with cytosine. Adding to this alphabet would require new chemicals that could not only bind to each other, but that wouldn't bind to any of the four established bases. There were a number of different candidate pairs that could be used in the genetic code. This milieu of molecules included ones that could mimic the original bases by pairing via hydrogen bonds. Or alternatively, there are molecules whose mutual repulsion of water brings them together. These molecules are known as hydrophobic nucleotides, and it is these hydrophobic nucleotides that would eventually get used in this paper. The name of these new nucleotides are deoxy 6 and deoxy -NAM. We're going to call them the unnatural base pairs. Initial work has shown that they can be incorporated into synthetically produced DNA strands, so why not see whether they can be produced in biologically made DNA, in a living organism? The first step is to actually get these unnatural nucleotides into a living organism, such as E. coli. But the first problem was actually getting their unnatural nucleotides into the cells in the first place. E. coli has nucleotide transporters, which theoretically can do this. They aren't very good. Researchers have tried to improve their uptake by engineering E. coli cells to produce loads of these transporters, so even if one of them isn't good, at least the sheer numbers of them could sort of make up for it. But in the process, it made these cells very ill. So they looked at a couple of different versions of this enzyme from different species to see how well they take up nucleotides. So the researchers engineered different E. coli strains to express these nucleotide transported proteins from a ton of different species. They then added radioactive adenine triphosphate to these cells as a stand-in for the unnatural nucleotides. The cells that absorb these molecules tended to become radioactive, and the more molecules they took up, the more radioactive they get. They put these cells onto photographic paper, which turns black when exposed to radiation. The bigger the back smudges, the more radioactive the cells, and the more radioactive the cells, the more triphosphate that they've taken up. So you can see the enzymes that allow their host cells to absorb the most adenine triphosphate are from Thalassiocera pseudonana and Phyodactylum triconutum. But there is another problem. These unnatural bases aren't exactly stable. When they are incubated with E. coli, something bad happened. These nucleotides have three phosphates attached to them. That's their basic structure. And you can tell how many phosphates are attached to a molecule using liquid chromatography. If you force them through a medium, like a silica gel, or even paper, the lighter molecules will travel faster, and the heavier molecules will travel slower. Therefore, an unnatural base with three phosphates will travel slower than one with two phosphates. If you take a sample of E. coli's growth medium just after the unnatural triphosphates have been added, you can see that there is a massive peak for the triphosphate, and slightly smaller peaks showing that some of the triphosphate has begun to degrade to a biphosphate with two phosphates, and a monophosphate with just one phosphate. But as time goes on, the number of molecules with three phosphates goes down, and the other peaks go up, as they all lose phosphates. These molecules are degrading. And this ain't good, because we need all three phosphates on that molecule in order for it to actually slot into the DNA strand and work. How did the researchers stop this degradation from occurring? They added free phosphate to the medium, which was found to actually slow down the degradation of these unnatural base pairs. So we know which nucleotide triphosphate transporters work, and how to help the nucleotide triphosphates survive long enough to encounter them. Let's put those findings together. How well will the cells absorb the nucleotides now? The researchers engineered E. coli to express the nucleotide triphosphate transporters only when they come into contact with a compound called IPTG. They dump them in the medium with a mix of their nucleotide triphosphates plus the free phosphates and a little IPTG added into the mix. The more IPTG you give, the more nucleotide triphosphates they suck up. But as the amount of IPTG in the medium goes up, the number of bacteria go down. When these cells have too many transporters, it makes them slightly ill. Okay, so let's go deeper. Where are these nucleotide triphosphates meeting their doom? The cells were separated from the medium in which they grew, and were themselves analysed for the presence of the triphosphate, and thus the various degraded versions of it. Remember that these black smudges indicate the presence of radioactive phosphates attached to the ATP, and the heavier molecules will be at the bottom, and the lighter ones will be at the top. So we see the media initially has steady levels of triphosphate, a little bit of biphosphate, and the monophosphate only really starts to show up after two hours. When looking at the direct uptake of these triphosphates into the cell, this is where the Phyodactylum triconutum nucleotide transport 
water showed how good it was. The build-up is slow, and it only reaches detectable levels by 4 hours, but there is definitely triphosphate present in these cells, even if they are much lower than the, the amount of monophosphates. The researchers say that since the ratio of monophosphates to triphosphates remains the same throughout the experiment, that these products are in some sort of equilibrium, meaning that the degradation never truly clears up all of the nucleotide triphosphate. So now we know that these unnatural nucleotides can get into cells and yada yada, but what we came here for was to see how these unnatural nucleotides can be engineered into the genetic code. Let me tell you how they did it. If you want to replicate any DNA strand using normal bases, you need to have a template for it to use. The same goes with any code into which we want to incorporate the unnatural base pair. The researchers created oligonucleotides with the unnatural bases within them, then used these oligonucleotides to put them into a plasmid. It should be noted that they didn't put in deoxy-6 in their constructed plasmid, instead they used a compound called TPT, and I'll get into the reasons why later. They took a plasmid and they replicated it using PCR in the presence of the oligonucleotide with the unnatural base pair. This plasmid was then named PINF, as in for plasmid of information. The researchers came up against another problem. E. coli cells tend to use polymerase 3, which doesn't like to use the unnatural nucleotides for replication. So we are forced to turn to its less fastidious relative, polymerase 1, which is okay with replicating unnatural base pairs. However, polymerase 1 only works near the origin of replication of the plasmid. This is the part of the plasmid that attracts all the complex molecular machines needed to kickstart its replication. Since it is a target of polymerase 1, this is naturally where we'd want to put unnatural base pairs to ensure that they are actually replicated into the plasmid. So they created this plasmid with the TPT in a section near the origin of replication, and then they inserted that plasmid into E. coli cells. Will it work? How will we know whether this plasmid is actually replicating? This is why TPT was used. TPT behaves in the same way as deoxy-6. When they have a plasmid with TPT in it, and they saturate the medium with deoxy-6 and deoxy -NAT. During the plasmid's replication, 6 will replace TPT. You can tell whether a plasmid has actually replicated because it will have 6 and not TPT. After 15 hours of growth, the plasmids were broken down into single bases and run through liquid chromatography. You can see a massive peak for cytosine, another massive peak for guanine, and a small peak for thymine, a massive peak for adenine, and down here you see that tiny bump. That is a peak for D6. You'd expect it to be low because in a plasmid with 2,686 base pairs, only one of those is D6. So you'd expect there to be a very small peak, and lo and behold, there it is. The fact that we don't detect TPT at all means that these plasmids were constructed by the cell. To check whether D6 is in the right place, the extracted plasmids were analysed using special oligonucleotides attached to a biotin marker. Biotin is a marker that can be bound by another protein called streptovidin, which is heavy, making it run slower through gels. If the original template has an unnatural base pair, it'll run slower and thus create another band. So this band shows that the specific targeted DNA sequence has unnatural base pairs. To further confirm that researchers tried out Sanger sequencing, when Sanger sequencing comes up against a base pair, the entire reaction grinds to a halt at the exact point where the unnatural base pair is to be found. And lo and behold, that is what is seen. They ran this experiment for as long as possible without adding any new source of unnatural base pairs to see how long their plasmids remained in the cells. They measured the amount of the plasmid of information containing the unnatural base pair. As the unnatural bases decay and are lost from the medium, the replication of the plasmid of information slows down. The bands represent the plasmid of information become dimmer as the experiment goes on until only 30% of the bacteria tested still had it by the sixth day. We just witnessed the rewriting of the code of life. Such a thing hasn't happened in millions, hell, probably billions of years. But just like any scientific paper, there are certain criticisms to be had, and this would usually be the part of the video where I'd raise those criticisms, but this week I'm going to do something different. You see, next week I'm going to be moderating discussion of this paper for the Microbiology Twitter Journal Club. The Microbiology Twitter Journal Club is a forum where scientists and students can get together to discuss recent findings in microbiology. It's like a book club, but instead of talking about books, we read scientific papers. It's an opportunity to hear what other specialists in the field think about the paper, where we bite into the data and the methodology, and see how well it hangs together under scrutiny. The best part is, you can be a part of that discussion. The only real requirement is that you read the paper. The link's in the description. For those of you who can't make it, don't worry, I'll be making a summary video of the discussion afterwards, complete with criticisms and explanations. So tune in to Twitter at 8pm BST and follow hashtag microTWJC to follow the discussion, and tweet with that hashtag to become a part of it. I hope to see you there.